Now, this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down, and I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, and I'll tell you about how I became the multiliteracies researcher with Flair. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire, and I'm so glad to be here as a guest on the, tr on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek, and to be able to share my research journey with you. First, some background information. I was a high school English teacher for 10 years. I noticed how my students were engaging more with visual text like film. This piqued my interest in visual literacy and led me to wonder about how images impact viewers' understanding about issues or events. This curiosity led me to graduate studies. My master's thesis focused on the value of teaching narrative film in secondary English classrooms. I argued for the critical analysis of film to develop visual literacy visual literacy skills and hone the traditional analytical skills that, doc, that educators deem significant. And so began my introduction and interest in multiliteracies. As a multiliteracy scholar, I am interested in the following question. How is information mediated across different platforms and how does it affect your understanding of issues, events, and of people? Or in the wise words of one of my mentors, asking ourselves, how do you know what you know? It is these questions that frame much of my research. Let me share. The nuanced play of images have a very powerful, persuasive effect on viewers and have an impact on shaping people's understanding of environmental issues. For Specifically, I look at what kinds of images are used in environmental documentaries and how they impact viewers' awareness of issues, including their willingness to act in more eco-conscious ways. It is evident that viewers do not respond favorably to apocalyptic images or those that imply an impending ecological doom or images attributing human behavior to the cause of a crisis, such as the image you see on your screen now. These types of images do not motivate, rather they leave most folks feeling hopeless and apathetic. Viewers are more motivated if they can make a personal connection to the image, normally of a place that reminds them of home, such as the image seen here of Moline Lake in Jasper, Alberta, a place where I feel the most connected. These kinds of images evoke a personal response in relation to the potential loss of such a landscape. With some documentaries, we come to expect to see certain kinds of images. These are patterns. They are inherently learned and socially constructed. So with Attenborough-esque type documentaries such as Blue Planet, you can probably think of a few common patterns, right? Now, what happens if the trusted genre then disrupts your expectations? Then what? Well, I'll tell you what. Many viewers turn away, are confused, or upset. For example, viewers were distraught when they witnessed walruses literally falling to their death in the series One Planet narrated by Attenborough. Viewers were shocked, horrified, and many needed to stop watching the series. The images were difficult to watch, but I argue that viewers' reactions were stronger because their expectations of the genre pa pattern of one planet were disrupted. The larger question is, were viewers still inclined to change their attitudes or did they simply turn away? This is a question I hope to investigate further. The ways in which people receive information about particular social justice issues has become an interesting phenomenon. Results from my pilot study, a survey that investigated people's media usage and their experiences with fake news indicate that many young people tend to rely on social media, such as Facebook and Instagram, to stay informed. This pattern has emerged again in a study that my colleague, Dr. Tashika Pillay and I have just started. We are exploring the experience of youth and their learning of some of the major events that have been occurring in the last few months, such as with Black Lives Matter, police brutality, and COVID. Of the participants who we have spoken to so far, Many receive information about events such as Black Lives Matter through Instagram. All participants have mentioned that they do not discuss these issues in class, and very few have mentioned that they have had opportunities to discuss any social justice issues and actually engage in difficult conversations with their teachers. Of further interest is that most of the information that young participants receive about social issues is in direct connection to what was happening in the US such as with Black Lives Matter. Participants, for example, knew less about the WE charity scandal and the wet sweats and protests. And with the latter, they noticed it was difficult to find information with indigenous perspectives. Then in thinking about genre and the question, how do you know what you know? It is also thinking about the inclusion and exclusion of particular groups of people. 
who is being privileged or further marginalized? And what effect does this have on people's understanding of issues, events, and of people? It is also about considering the authenticity of information being shared, even if it is just a caption. Because according to my pilot study and the study with Dr. Pillay, many people often only read the headlines. And so headings such as the one you see on your screen now are highly problematic and result in perpetuating racism against particular groups of people. We must also not forget about the sheer volume of information we face on a daily basis and the implication of fake news, or what I like to refer to as deceptive media to include all possible formats. What impact does this have on us, on our young students, and what supports are needed for students and educators? My research projects thus far have been consistent in highlighting two key issues. First, and broadly speaking, media platforms have a great impact on people's understanding and awareness of issues. Specifically, it is important to think about the genre and its representational patterns, such as the nuanced play of visual images. Second is the importance of including critical digital literacy education into classrooms well, and not simply as a means to an end. Critical digital literacy includes the ability to navigate and analyze digital environments, but also to identify, evaluate, and apply information effectively. There is nothing we can do about the shifting nature of the media landscape, but what we can do is to provide better support for educators to better guide students to be more aware, to be more critical, and thus be more confident in being able to distill coherent values from the information they receive and to act responsibly on these values around important issues. Thank you for listening.